Good evening and welcome. My name is Bruce Campbell. I'm the director of the Latino Latin American Studies Program. Um, <clears throat> tonight's event is the first in our spring event series on immigrant voices and conversations about justice. A series of three public conversations with representatives of the Asamblea de Derechos Civiles, or Assembly for Civil Rights, a faith-based immigrant empowerment organization here in Minnesota. Following this evening's conversation about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, we will hold a second event on February 13 on the topic of economic justice, and a third event on March 13 to discuss immigrants' participation in and contributions to the public arena. The underlying theme of these conversations is justice. And the premise of the series is that the fraught national conversation about immigration is frequently not a conversation in which immigrants have a voice. While there is much heated talk about immigrants, in which immigrants are an object of reference, there is considerably less public talk in which immigrants are a party to the discussion. Immigrants, in other words, are too often object instead of actor, problem instead of person, divisive topic rather than conversational partner. Here in central Minnesota, <clears throat> this challenge has a long history. Lest we forget this, here is a quote from a piece published in the local weekly newspaper, The Stearns Morrison Enterprise, back in 1980. Quote, <clears throat> at the time when Stearns County was being settled by Catholic immigrants from Germany, there was much antipathy against any persons who were not white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant, or WASP. Non-WASPs were derided for their odd language and odd customs. <clears throat> Argentine philosopher, historian, and theologian Enrique Dussel argues that a conversation about what is right, about what is just, must open to the voices of the excluded, to hear and acknowledge their lived material circumstances. Injustice, Dussel writes, is lived as pain. In this sense, what is often called the problem of immigration is at least in part a problem about who speaks and how we listen. With this in mind, I'm very honored to introduce to you tonight three panelists from the Asamblea de Derechos Civiles, our very own Gladys Gutierrez, <clears throat> a student here at the College of St. Benedict and a community organizer for Asamblea, Patty Keeling, who is vice president of Asamblea, and Nathaniel Waltz, a, a DACA recipient and high school student from the, the St. Cloud area. Our panelists will talk tonight about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA. They will offer us an overview of the DACA program and its current status, as well as testimony about the importance of the program for DACA recipients or DREAMers. We will then open the floor for questions and discussion. Please join me in a warm welcome. Good evening. Um, I know that I was already introduced, but I'm going to repeat that. I'm Patty Keeling. I'm the Vice Pres President of Asamblea de Derechos Civiles, which is the Assembly of Civil Rights. And what or who is Asamblea? That's my job to tell you. Um, we started in 2006. We, are, we were a group of committed leaders that decided there were issues in the immigrant community and they needed to be addressed. We started with 20 leaders that met for the first time and now we have grown to over 350 leaders. So um, we've, we've really surpassed in many ways. In um, 2008, we were established as the 501c3 um, organization, which means that um, we pay no income tax on donations and on fundraising, but we can, cannot endorse any candidate or party. We, however, we do have forms for candidates and that, and we have both parties there, always. Uh, we are a nonprofit, um, faith-based organization. Our office is at St. Joe's Church in 
Waite Park. We also work closely with the Diocese of St. Cloud and Minneapolis St. Paul. So we have access to all of those churches and work very closely in many of them. We, um, other faiths that we also have been connected with, of course, are the Mennonites, um, who we do have one on our board right now, the pastor, and we also have a pastor from the Methodist Church and United Church of Christ. So um, we primarily work with Latina immigrants. Um, we were, and because we are associated with the Spanish-speaking churches, that has been our draw, is the Latinas. Um, and in St. Joseph's in Wade Park, we have a large congregation which we service. The, it's a community-based um, organization, which means that we listen to their concerns, the issues that they're having, whatever they, and I mean, we get calls every single day from people that are in trouble, need help, um, want to find out where to go, what to do. Um, so, you know, we listen to that and then we formulate, um, we formulate action plans and strategies um, to, you know, get that taken care of, whatever it might be. In this case right now, it's DACA, and we have been working on that continuously since September. We're a grassroots organizing um, organization, <laughs> which means that, of course, we work from the bottom up. We, like I said, we talk to the people, we listen to them, we, um, and they're the ones that really decide where we're going first. And um, we're based on um, relationship building, and that is how we have grown from 20 people to 350. Because we develop personal relationships with each and every person, which is a very um, important key to developing your organization. Right now, we have um, three campaigns that we're running. And number one would be the immigration. Um, and that has to do, of course, with um, our ultimate key is to obtain citizenship for all members living here in the United States. That's our hope. That's our dream. Uh, we've, we've really pushed our, um, our senators, our representatives very hard. We've made um, many, many trips to Washington, D.C. So um, it's, and that's a key. It's to push them and, and to get backing from all of the people here and everywhere else in the community because you can't get anything pushed unless people stand up for it. And I think we've seen that in you know, with the health care and all of those things, if people would not have stood up, then um, it never could have, we never could have um, stopped what was coming. So I think that's a key thing. And um, I hope everybody in this room is willing to stand up to, for, to help us to obtain this citizenship for all. I, and um, we also um, have the dream 2000 or 2050 is what we're calling that piece. Um, it has to do with getting people out to vote. Um, we know that um, recently, well, in 2015, that through the Pew Research Center, 
um, they said that there is 66,000 Latinos that gain the right to vote. So that means every 30 seconds, a Latina is turning 18 and has the right to vote. And so it's our hope that we can get out there and get them registered. And it, of course, we all know that with uh, um, elections coming up in November, that this is gonna be a big key to moving things. Um, we also work with the affordable housing and tenant rights. Um, we've done work in the mobile home parks here in this city and in Cold Spring with getting them organized um, into housing associations to protect their rights. And also there's a mobile home park in the cities of, well, in the city of St. Anthony, and I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but Lowry Grove, which was closed. And so we spent the whole summer working to um, keep them in the mobile home park, but um, that did not happen. But we, but we are working to get affordable housing for those people. And the city, um, we've been to their city council um, many times. We've, we've marched down the streets of their city. We've gone into their city council meetings. And it is, again, about people standing up for you. And we had many of the neighbors in that area also standing up for those, the, the rights of people and pushing for affordable housing. They did many petitions, and um, I think the city was very impressed with all of that. Now it's just our hope that we can get affordable housing in St. Anthony. And we'll look at St. Cloud, too. Um, I would like to read the, our Declaration of Emancipation, and um, it goes as this. Through this document, we proclaim the thoughts of people about something now already old, which is not only justice, it is our destiny. Many civilizations have pursued in, in many parts of the world, whether in Europe, Asia, Africa, or Americas under events occurring in different eras and circumstances, like the famous exodus from Egypt or the infamous slavery in Americas. In all of these examples, there was always something in common, racism, social class, national origin, which drove evil systems to oppress and dominate other human beings. Through history, we hear the cries of women, children, and men. People, communities, and entire societies lived in hunger for freedom and dreamed of peace with justice in, form of a, in, in the form of an emancipation that would recognize their sacred humanity through them to a place in society with the same rights and responsibilities of everyone else. Emancipation is a cycle that is part of human nature that invites the people to purify themselves, to ensure the well-being of their future generations where everyone will have the power to live free and in peace as productive members of society without fear of ty or tyranny, of tyranny. We live in a new millennium, and the cycle of emancipation will repeat itself against evil that has been globalized with great sophistication, making us slaves to injustice. As in other times, today we have women, we have children, we have men who are part of a people, a community 
that thirsts for liberty. We also dream of the peace and the, and the justice of emancipation that, it, that recognizes our sacred humanity and gives us more strength to continue rejecting immoral systems that attempt to steal our dignity, our peace, and the freedom of our souls, minds, and bodies, condemning us as less than human. Our emancipation isn't just a path. It is our destiny, which we neither can nor want to escape. It united us in the past, it strengthens us in the present, and it will liberate us in the future. Our emancipation will not come easy, but as we remember history, light will conquer the darkness. Our destiny will overcome injustice, and that is why we proclaim that emancipation is the transformation of community, society, and the system for the liberation of immigrant people, a people in struggle. And that's all I have, except for I did want to say that in our year 2017, we um, had more than 100 activities throughout the whole year. And that's a lot when you think about, that's probably about eight per month, which keeps us all very, very busy. But we're struggling for all the right things. And with that, I will pass it on to um, Gladys, who is going to tell you and inform you a little more about the DACA program that we have been fighting for. Thank you, Patty. Um, so yes, my name is Gladys Gutierrez. I am a senior at the College of St. Benedict studying communication. I graduate this May, so class of 2018, woo! <laughs> um, so yes, um, actually, like Patty said, Asamblea de Derechos Civiles was founded in 2006. And um, when I was 10 years old, my, I actually got involved through my mother. And or when I was 10 years old, she would drag me to the meetings in the cities because Asamblea was actually not in St. Cloud. It started in the Twin City area. And I would be so upset because I thought I had better things to do. 10-year-old mind. But <laughs> um, and I eventually, as I felt that my identity as a Mexican Latina woman from an immigrant family, I felt that my identity was being targeted, especially under this administration and um, things that came earlier. So um, I hung out enough, and they offered me a job. So that goes to show if you, you know, stick around somewhere enough, they might offer you a job. So you're graduating this year. Pay attention. <laughs> All right, so, um, and other things that are worth mentioning, um, that activities that we did in the past year regarding the three different campaigns that we mainly focus on is that we took around 50 people to Washington, D.C. Um, right before the session ended um, for Christmas break. So we brought um, DACA beneficiaries to come and give their testimony to senators and representatives and really get our voice out there. Um, we always say, uh, Minnesota, si se nota. It's Minnesota is noticed. Um, so, yeah. All right, so I'm here to talk about DACA. So DACA, how does it work? Um, so this was a program that was established in 2012 as an executive order by President Obama. Um, during this time, we had youth that was brought um, to the United States at a very young age, undocumented, and they were growing up um, with concerns of how am I going to work, how am I going to go to school, how am I going to accomplish my dreams. Um, and they were also in fear of deportation. So what President Obama did in 2012 is as an executive order, um, he created DACA, Deferred Action Childhood Arrival. Um, so we, but this did not just happen out of, Obama didn't just wake up one day as like, hey, I'm going to create DACA, this is so cool. No, actually we along with other organizations around the country pressured Congress and the Senate to pass the Clean Dream Act. However, Congress never agreed to it, instead President Obama put this in place through the executive order. Um, so yes, deferred action for childhood arrival. 
um, meaning that kids who were brought to the United States without legal documentations were not at risk for deportation. To be eligible for this program, however, you must have come to the United States before your 16th birthday, have lived continuously in the United States since June of 2007, and had not have convicted a felony or a serious misdemeanor. Um, the demographic of DACA beneficiaries today is between the ages of 16 and 35, and the average recipient is 26 years old. So while many think, when we think of DACA, we think of children, actually much of them are well into their young adulthood and are adults. Um, so, and then let's talk, I'm gonna talk about the ups and the downs of DACA. So while this program was really, really good, it was a, a huge aid, it was only supposed to be temporary. There was supposed to be a step that followed it. So the ups about DACA are that beneficiaries are able to get a driver's license, a social security number to work, get a job with health benefits, pursue a higher education, pay utility bills under their own name, and be without DACA, these people would not have been able to have these liberties that we as citizens take advantage of. So, and then just to mention, even though they do have the social security number to work, they are not able to claim social security benefits. Um, it's a misconception that some of us have. Uh, in order to have gained DACA, beneficiaries had to pay hundreds, even thousands of dollars in lawyer fees, and on top of that, um, the fee to get the app to turn in the application. In addition to this cost, um, they also had to pay in order to get documents such as their passport, birth certificate, and other documents required to attain DACA. These people also must um, prove that they have remained in the country since, two th since June of 2007 through address, records, bills, all that nitty gritty stuff. Um, once they have attained DACA, they must renew it through an application process and pay a fee of $495 on top of their lawyer's fees. Um, during this time, they must also go in to be fingerprinted, meaning that government officials have every piece of information about these people. So we can see how that's problematic when it has ended because they have every piece of information. Every yes, Bob. Um, Bob is one of our board members. Let's give a round of applause for Bob. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, yes, um, we just had recent elections for our board, so if you get involved enough, you might get elected to be on our board. Um, but yes, every two years, meaning they have to pay this fee, $495, every two years on top of their lawyer fees. And um, like I said, although DACA beneficiaries have a social security number to work, um, they don't get the, the benefits of SSI and they have to pay taxes. They are unable to collect social security benefits or um, like have a retirement plan, get welfare or public assistance programs. So now, DACA moving forward. Um, so a misconception that we have is that we think that DACA is, is still going on. DACA is dead. DACA was terminated, unfortunately, on September 5th, 2017 as an executive order by President Trump. Trump has given Congress until March 2018 to decide if they're going to keep DACA or repeal it for good. So beneficiaries of DACA can no longer renew their status. They have until uh, their permit expires to be able to work and go to school legally. According to Congressman Luis Gutierrez of Illinois, 122 DACA beneficiaries lose their status every single day. This means that they are, they can be deported as soon as their DACA is expired. As of today, more than 12,000 people have lost their DACA status. Federal Judge William Elsup from San Francisco, California has temporarily blocked Trump's decision to terminate DACA. And this means that people whose DACA expired are able to renew it and those whose DACA will soon expire are able to reapply for another two years. But no new applicants can be taken. People who have never had DACA but are now eligible are not able to get accepted because in order to apply for the program, you would have had to be 15 years old. So for example, right now, I have a cousin who's 14, gonna be 15. He's not able to apply anymore. And he's got big dreams, bigger than mine. So now, 
Our organization and thousands more around the country are fighting for what is called a Clean Dream Act. So right now, since DACA was only supposed to be temporary, it didn't have um, any path to citizenship or get these kids, young adults, on the road to be legal citizens and be able to get all of the benefits that I or you would get as citizens. So now our organization is fighting for a Clean Dream Act. This would allow for a path to citizenship. Um, so, and it's, I think it's worth mentioning other programs um, that are similar to DACA, uh, Temporary Protected Status, TPS, has also been terminated. Um, so that means that people from these 13 countries, El Salvador, Guinea, Haiti, Honduras, Liberia, Nepal, Nicaragua, Sierra Leone, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen um, are also in fear of deportation once their status ends. And these people came to this country because of natural disasters, because of violence, um, because this, this was what they needed to do in order to survive. Um, so yes, that is all um, I have for what DACA is. And lastly, I wanted to mention that DACA students, there's a misconception, another one. DACA students are not only from uh, Latino countries. They come from all parts of the world. It just happens to be that we are the face of it right now. And that's the same with undocumented immigrants in the United States. We just happen to be the face you know, brown people, we happen to be the face of the immigrant, but we have undocumented immigrants that are white, that are from all continents of the world. Um, so that's what I have, and then I'm gonna pass it down to youth leader Nathaniel Walls. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nathaniel Walls. I am 16 years old, and although I was born in Maracay, Venezuela, I am from here. Uh, at the age of two, my parents brought me, he, me and my sister to the United States. The situation in Venezuela was, was only getting worse. If we would have stayed there, uh, we would have not have survived. Venezuela, the government was failing us and still is failing its people. It's a dictatorship disguised as a socialism. Even though both of my parents worked, they were still not able to make the payments and put food on the table. Our lives were at stake. My dad used to work for a government institution, and since he voiced that he was not okay with what they were doing, the government had uh, threatened him, and he had to leave his job. Uh, at this point, my parents made the sacrifice of leaving everything behind and bringing me and my sister to the United States. Uh, we arrived here in 2004. And since then, I have been able to take advantage of good education. I have, I'm a devoted student at Cathedral High School. I am fascinated with algebra, calculus, uh, chemistry, physics, biomechanics, bioengineering, uh, biochemistry, and so many more. Uh, even though I'm only in 10th grade, I will be taking uh, college level classes next year. Uh, uh, on my pre-ACT test, I have gone above and beyond the average score. I work on a dairy farm three hours a day a uh, week uh, to save up for my college tuition. My dream is to go to MIT and study for aerospace engineering and bioengineering. DACA allows me to accomplish this dream, but on, as you know, September 15, 2017, President Chubb took this away from me and many more dreamers. As mentioned, before, DACA allows me to get uh, the best education and to do what I love. Uh, today, I am a youth leader at the Assembly of Derechos Civiles, also known as Assembly for Civil Rights. Because I am fighting to keep my DACA and push for Clean Dream Act, I have five younger siblings who are depending on me to be their role model, and I can't let them down. I can't let my parents' sacrifice and hard work go to waste, and as you know, I need this a program to survive in this country that my parents and I have given so much to. We deserve more than just DACA. We deserve a path to citizenship that can not help just me, but also families and people who strive to make this country better. And that's pretty much all about me and why we are fighting for the Clean Dream Act and trying to keep DACA here for us. Thank you, Nathaniel.
And Nathaniel is one of hundreds of thousands um, who have the same story. It makes me emotional when I hear it. Um, but yes, and he also went um, to Washington, D.C., and he gave his same testimony to senators and representatives. He's a very brave individual, and I admire him very, very much. Um, so now we will pass the mic to you if you have any questions, if you want to get involved. Um, oh, look, there's a slide for that. <laughs> <laughs> So if you want to get involved, actually this Saturday we will be having our Asamblea Immigration Meeting, otherwise known as AIM. Um, so it'll be the Saturday at 10 a.m. And also, if Clean Dream Act does not get passed before the session ends in March, we will be taking another coach bus, not just a bus, a coach bus, to Washington, D.C., and um, it's a great learning experience that builds your leadership and your character, and um, we are a nonprofit organization, so we are funded by grants. Um, you would not have to pay for anything. Um, just get off of school. We can give you a letter so you can send to your professors. Um, but yes, we usually go for one week, and this is, would be the last time that we get to fight for Clean Dream Act. Um, and also, uh, uh, one of our members, Lucas, is actually passing around um, a list of phone numbers of our senators and our U.S. representatives from here, from Minnesota. And there's a script that you can you, uh, use to call them and tell them to keep to keep DACA and, or pass Clean Dream Act. The dream, the dream now is to pass Clean Dream Act. Um, so yes, questions. Um, when you make these calls, it's very important. You know, tomorrow is the day that um, the funding bill is due, and we really want them, the dem well, all of them, to stand up and say, no funding bill unless we get the DREAM Act. So really try to go home tonight and make those calls. Fill all of those telephone lines. That's and that's very important. And it's past hour, so you won't need to talk to someone awkwardly. You just <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So. I was just curious because I did, for, I'm a Hispanic studies major, so I did research on DACA for my thesis this year. I was just wondering, like, where can I get more information about what the Clean Dream Act looks like? Because maybe I didn't look hard enough, but I couldn't find any, like, suggestions that people have come up with in place of DACA. Is that something I can find with a simple Google search? You should be able to. What do you okay. mean in place of? I just, like, because part of my research was kind of looking at, like, what, mostly the Republican Party had, like, come up with as a, like as something to like come up with like, well, we don't want DACA anymore, so like what else are we gonna do with it? And I just couldn't really find any information on that. Right, so um, <coughs> there are a lot, of tape, uh, a lot of other bills on the table, but we have, we always, as Patty said, have, <laughs> we always have the community's interest, the best interest in mind, and we've looked through all of them, the RAC, and um, DACA is good, but as I said, it could do a lot better, and that's why we came out with Clean Dream Act, so that would be the best one. Um, and the bill is, so you can find the bill with a simple Google search, and I can help you too, and I can email you that if you need. But, but thank you so much for doing your thesis on that, that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you all for coming and talking us, to us tonight. Um, I was just curious about what clean in front of the DREAM Act means. Oh, sorry. What does the clean in front of Clean DREAM Act mean? Sure. The clean um, means that they don't have a lot of added other things to it. We aren't. We don't really want the wall. We don't really want, you know, all of those, uh, you know, all of the money poured into security. We would just like to have, you know, um, 
the citizenship, the right to get their citizenship. But we know that if we can just get it on the floor and they can talk about it, we would be okay with some of those things, but that not being the main thing. The main thing is just citizenship, that clear and simple citizenship, the right to have citizenship. And clean also means, I mean, don't use these 800,000 li lives as bargaining chips for a wall. Because, <laughs> retweet, thank you. <laughs> Just enough characters, too. Um, so yes, we did not as bargaining chips. Um, these are lives, these are people who are fighting for this country on the daily, who have served for this country, um, and they deserve citizenship. So no need to bargain. If, for us that were born in the United States, we, needed, we didn't need a bargain. Did we? Um, so, yeah. Hi, my name's Aransa, um, and I'm a, so, I'm a, oh my gosh, not sophomore, I'm a junior at this college, and I just wanted to personally say thank you so much for doing what you guys are all doing, because you guys all filled my heart with strength. Um, a lot of you guys know me out in the audience, and some of you guys don't, but I too am a part of DACA, and and it's really emotional. It feels, um, <laughs> you guys know. <laughs> and, no. <laughs> oh, I didn't think I'd cry, but I'm a crier. <laughs> I'm not crying. <laughs> that's, just, that's just the way I am. And so, um, I, I didn't think last year I'd be up here crying or like expressing myself as um, what's a part of me, what's a part of my history or life. Um, it's, it's a real thing, it's really a real thing and many things like interfere with what we can and cannot do. Some people ask why aren't you studying abroad and this is the real reason why I can't study abroad and um, it's really nice and, and somewhat liberating to just kind of be out of those shadows and if you guys have any questions I'd be more than happy to share my story with you guys. So, thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to ask all of you who are planning on attending the caucuses in February to please ask your, or put a, a request or a petition in asking that all persons be treated equally under the tax laws. Presently, the, not, the undocumented are not allowed the uh, earned income credit. Under the new tax law, they're not going to be allowed the child tax credit. They presently, a family of three making $40,000, presently pays a penalty of about $4,800 because they're undocumented. They can have children who are citizens and they're still paying that penalty. And it's just unfair, I think. They're all working. They're all do, doing the same kind of things everybody else does. They're not collecting. And in the, in the new tax law, not only will they not collect on the earned income credit, they will not collect on the child tax credit, which means they are going to pay way more tax than any citizen. And that's just not fair. So if you go to a caucus, please put in a, re, a petition stating equal taxation for all people. Please, thank you. Hi, um, I won't be able to attend the uh, meeting tomorrow morning or um, Saturday morning, but I'm just wondering, um, aside from the, you know, um, getting involved with um, contacting our representatives' house, um, would I be able to um, gain? information as far as what you'll be discussing or uh, how else I can get involved? 
I think if you give us your um, email address and telephone number, um, we would be happy to send something out to you because like I said, or like Gladys said, we will have another meeting in another two weeks, more than likely, because we know that this issue is not dead. And um, I do wanna mention too that um, I know that many of you probably aren't even aware of how many people from our own area are being deported. Um, we're working with the sheriff, um, we're working with the police agreement, we're working with um, you know, human rights office. Um, we, we are trying to educate the families and the people um, to keep them safe. We have rapid response teams that when um, we get a message about ICE coming somewhere, whether it be um, coming to the car, coming to, um, you know, surrounding a car or to work or at their home, they message us, we get it out there and the rapid response team shows up. And hopefully we can detain ICE from coming and taking them away. We are trying to do everything we can to keep our people and our families safe and here with us. Also, you can like us on Facebook at Asamblea de Derechos Civiles, and we have now a Snapchat, Asamblea MN, where you can uh, follow us when we go on trips to Washington, D.C., to lobby, or when we're doing actions here locally. And we are also on Instagram at Asamblea de Derechos Civiles. Um, yeah. <laughs> So come along. More questions or comments? Thank you all so, so much for your testimonies and for what you do. Uh, in the discussion, a lot of times we say that we need citizenship and an easier route towards citizenship. And I'm also all for this. But I'm just wondering if you could each talk more about what this would really look like and what the system could be or another easier way towards citizenship. But there has to be. I don't know, like what this would look like tangibly, if you could speak towards that. Um, so right now, I use, actually used to work at a worker center, um, and we were doing citizenship workshops where, so in order to become a citizen, you actually have to become a resident. So it's like a Mario game where you just have to, you know, levels up. Um, so yes, and you must be a resident for four years and nine months before you can apply for citizenship. And I mean, that comes with um, 700 and some dollars and turning in the application on top of lawyer fees. It's not cheap. So that's, I mean, that's what it would look like. So first, the students, um, yes, you can speak to that. An average cost for citizenship is between uh, $8,000 to $25,000. Thank you. Yes. Um, so it's not cheap. Um, but I mean, this is what we have to go through in order to attain a status in the United States. So it'd be first residency and finally, so it's a path, that's what we want. We want a clear path. Just like how right now, um, someone who is a resident is able to become a citizen four years, nine months, is able to start the process, that's what we want. We want them a path to be able to attain residency and finally citizenship um, in the least amount of time possible, but yeah. I got the mic back again. I was just curious because Hosanna and I were talking about it as you were listing off like the prices for renewing DACA. Is there any justification as, justification as to why the process is so expensive compared to like getting a passport is like a hundred bucks or less, isn't it? Is there justification for that at all? Just because you're familiar with the process or like with it through your work? I don't know too much about why it costs that much. Do are you? Okay? Oh, I thought you took the mic. Never mind, sorry. I'm not sure as to why. Um, that's just the price. It's expensive. I mean, it just feels like when you're undocumented, everything is against you, and that's one of the things. It's, it's the money, but I mean, these, these people go to school, work, do their homework, and still manage to get that money to renew. Um, so, and there are funds that we are... Um, 
have been contact like contacted with where they have those um, it's like a big fund for if someone is unable to pay um, and we know someone we can direct them that way and see if they can apply through there but yes we don't I'm not sure why it's so expensive hi I'm Jennifer Bestie and I'm a theology professor here and one of the things that uh, deeply, deeply upsets me is just how much research there has been on the impact of Trump's repeal of DACA um, in terms of just the post-traumatic effects on DACA recipients, um, the high levels of anxiety and just the uncertainty that you have to experience with this. And I, um, I just, I just, you know, I. I I'm really, really worried about this, and I'm worried about March, if we do not come to an agreement, the kind of uncertainty that so many people are living with. And so I don't want to put the two of you on the spot, but I mean, maybe you could even just speak uh, and tell us a little bit about the effects that you've seen on the Latina communities since Trump repealed the DACA. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you get many phone calls. Yes, do you want to speak? I just want to say that, you know, here, right here in front of us right now, um, you can see how it is affecting this one, you know, one young woman. And this is happening, you know, like you said, we probably get calls every day. Yeah, and we do. And we hear the sad stories. And it is hard. It is hard because, you know, we want to give them hope. And so that's, what we're, that's why we we're fighting so hard for this. You know, we've got to stand up. And each and every one of you have to do your part. Make those calls. It makes a difference. It truly makes a difference. And if you believe that, you know, we can save. We can save people. And they're worth, everybody is worth being saved. But as far as um, what comes after that, you know, I, to pick up the pieces, I, don't, I think we'll all have to be doing a lot more. Um, I think you covered it. So I'm wondering if you could maybe speak about, I'm, you know, what I'm not hearing is, what about the employers? Um, I spoke with somebody from Jenny O, and she was saying how this was a couple of months ago, and she said, you know, with this DACA thing, we're going to lose hundreds, hundreds of employees. So why are we not hearing, I, I'm not hearing it, I guess, from the companies that are going to be short workers? I mean, we have basically full employment here in Minnesota, and where are we going to get these hundreds and, or thousands of people to process our turkey? Right. And I'm making light of that part, but I mean, seriously, why aren't they out there speaking for this, you know, retaining this as well? Or are they? And I'm, we're just, I'm just not hearing it. Um, I think one of our board members, Bob, actually has made some research on that. Yeah, there was a, an article uh, about There was an article about a month ago, maybe a little more than a month ago, it's estimated that 70% of all farm workers in this country are undocumented. And if you turn around and say 70% of all people supplying our food are deported because they're undocumented, we're gonna have a severe, very severe food shortage. If you wanna eat, that's part of the problem. If you send out all the undocumented people, we aren't going to have well, we, we will have cheap hamburger for real quick because they'll shut down all of the milk processing, pl milking plants or farms that have large milk dairies. I know one in Wisconsin, for instance, that has 12 undocumented workers. They rotate on a six month basis. They go to Mexico for six months, they come back for six months. Back to Mexico for six months, they come back for six months. That dairy would go underground, would go under the minute they come in there and decide to de deport all of those workers. And the price of milk will go up, the price of hamburger will go down because we'll be eating those milk cows. 
hamburger is what's made out of a milk cow when it's done being productive. And when they have to, they don't have anybody to milk them, they're gonna ship them to the slaughterhouse and you're gonna get a lot of cheap hamburger for a short period of time. Milk is gonna go up, a little while later the ice cream will go up, a little after that the, the cheese, cheese prices are gonna go up. All of your produce is gonna go up because the vast majority of grapefruit pickers, orange pickers, tomato pickers, cabbage, lettuce, grapes, those are all pretty much undocumented workers and we are not gonna have food to eat if we wind up deporting all of the undocumented. It's just absolutely asinine to think that we can get by without them. So, um, like I said, we're doing already a lot and we would love to reach out to the employers, but we need to, that's why we need your help. We need you to get, come and get involved and learn and help us build our capacity that way because it's true, that's a tool that we could use to our favor. We're, um, we're doing a lot for this country and we need to be recognized. I had another question. I think too that the, I know that many of the farmers that employ the undocumented, um, they um, don't want to speak up, which is understandable. Um, but, you know, again, if DACA is stopped, no more DACA no more anything for these young people, and they start deporting them, or they lose their right to work, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be hurting. Hi, do the recipients of DACA, do they receive any sort of um, healthcare assistance? No. Um, they're not eligible to receive those types of benefits unless their job I believe has them. Um, so if they're full time, I believe then they're able to receive the health benefits. But other than that, they can't get like Medicare, Medicaid, or what is it called? They're not eligible for those types of plans or Social Security, retirement. Um, so you know, medical bills are not cheap. So whenever you have to go to the doctor, it's um, you don't have to do a copay as we would. It's full price. Thank you. And I know because I have, personally, I have undocumented family members that have not seen a doctor for 10 years or more. So, and that's just the reality. We'd rather put food on the table than go get a checkup or um, dental checkup. Any more questions or comments? Okay. <laughs> Besides calling, what can we do as students? Well, besides calling, you could talk to your friends, tell them about it, have them tell more people, spread the word. That way you can help, be of help, like help us. And maybe not everyone can call, or you can do that way. And I think everybody wants to do more, especially on this, this um, issue. Um, but I, I think the, really the biggest piece w is making those calls. And you don't have to just call once. You know, we call every single day, you know, about 25 different numbers. Call not only um, the number there, but call their offices that are in Minnesota too. Leave messages everywhere. That's, that's about all that I can give you as far as what else to do. You know, if you're willing to take trips to Washington, D.C., like we said, we probably will be going. So, so I, um, I would just like to say that there's one really important thing that everybody here who's a citizen and 18 or older can do, that's vote. And um, if you live and go to school here, you can vote here. And we need your vote in central Minnesota. So, um, I mean, obviously that's, that's coming down the pike here in, in November, but um, always, always voting makes a difference. So 
do that for sure. And local, just really quick, local elections matter. So they really do make an impact. For example, if we can choose who the sheriff is, um, who the chief of police is. Right now, we're working on a communities of color and Saint Cla city of St. Cloud police agreement where um, people are able to present. If you're driving without a license, you're able to present a matricula, um, which is an ID from your place of origin. And you will not get in trouble for presenting that. Obviously, you'll get, you'll get a ticket for driving without a license, and somebody will have to come pick up your car, but you won't get deported for not driving without a license. So local, local elections are also extremely important. Oh. Hi, um, my name is Leslie, um, and I have a question. So right now, we're kind of like in the mode. We're talking about this. It's kind of a safe space at the moment. Um, I'm a political science major, and these kind of conversations get really awkward in class. I feel really intimidated to talk about this. Um, and right now, we're getting a lot of like information about DACA and what it is and how good it is, like all the like the pros for it, and like I'm for it. But um, what kind of arguments should we expect to hear from people that are against DACA? Like, what should we prepare for? Like, if I want to convince someone of why DACA is good, um, why we should do this, what kind of arguments am I should I be prepared to hear, and how can I fight those? Because, um, like, people really are against this, and I don't know why. So do you know why people are against this, and how we can, like, rebuttal that so that we can defend ourselves and not be, like, you know, intimidated? I think when people are against something, it's out of fear. Um, fear of the unknown. Um, so honestly, education is the best. If you can, you know, hit them with a personal story, like Nathaniel's and some facts, I think that's the best. And when they say, you know, well, we need, we need national security. We need to build this wall. We'll tell them, well, why do you feel this way? Um, Really, I know they're tough conversations to have, but you don't know how many I've had in the past year. And really, you're not gonna, might not change that person in that instant, but you'll get them to think and process that later when they're alone. So it's honestly having those tough conversations and really reading, reading, keeping up, follow a news site, any news site um, that's credible and keep up to date and inform your peers on that. Um, come to class prepared. Uh, that's all I can really tell you, but have those tough conversations, even if they're not easy, even if you come out of those conversations wanting to punch someone, yeah. but you, you got to do it. Thanks. A pillow. A pillow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, a second question regarding, again, employers. Um, employers know when they've hired undocumented people. Um, all my parents' employers know the situation. Um, so, like, they know. Um, how can we, like, is there any trouble that employers can get into if we prove that they know that they've hired undocumented people? Um, so I'm not too familiar with that, so I don't want to speak um, too much and give you false information, fake news. Um, but uh, what I do know is that, I mean, obviously it's not legal, and they can face penalties for doing that. Um, so it's a really gray area. Um, it's not something that we've really tapped into. But I know, I hear you, I hear what you're saying. They do know a lot of the times. And a lot of the times employers do hire undocumented people because no health benefits, um, cheap labor, and hard working people. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I don't have much information on that. I would just add as a sort of editorial comment that the question of the politics of DACA, um, consistently DACA polls at 70 to 80 percent approval among Americans. Mm -hmm. So it says it's by American political standards, it's wildly popular as, as a policy measure. Um, hello, my name is Eduardo. Um, thank you again for, uh, for all the information. Um, my question is more of a, maybe just a slash concern. Um, I'm originally from Houston, Texas. This is my fourth year here at St. John, St. Ben's. Um, as with other peers of mine that were out, are out of state, um, speaking from an out of state perspective, um, what can you recommend? You know, 
I know this organization is here in Minnesota, but is there any collaboration with other organizations in different states? And how do you get in contact with that to, um, you know, as me going back home, how can I still be involved, you know? Yes. With that, so. Um, so we're actually a part of a national network called uh, Gamaliel, Gamaliel, um, and there is a national campaign within that network called CRI, so that's the immigration campaign where different organizations from different parts of the country um, are involved in that, and I can get you connected. I mean, there's local organizations, local organizing that's going on and that we don't even know, but honestly, um, like doing a Google search or I can help you find an organization back home. And you're actually lucky. You can call your representatives from Minnesota and from Texas. So good for you. <laughs> um, but I can help you with that. Hi, Brother Dennis Beach uh, from St. John's Abbey and, and Philosophy Department. Just a little bit of information on employers, both some of them know and some of them don't know or they know but can pretend that they don't know. Mm -hmm. And one of the major employers of undocumented people in the area here, I know they will fire someone if they find out that they are actually undocumented. They don't want to know that, but if they find out. So I found this out when I was helping a woman apply for a U visa, which is a visa that someone can, can get if they are a victim of violence on US soil. It doesn't matter whether the person who committed the violence is a citizen or not a citizen. And she said that if she is successful in this U visa, it's been filed for about a year, well, just over a year right now. Um, and if she's successful, she will be fired from her work. But then she, her hope is that then she will be able to get new work. Um, it seems to me I, they really don't want to know any details. And so when I go to, sometimes I go to pick her up, I actually to meet with her lawyer, uh, to go to a dentist appointment or something, I go to pick her up at work and I've got to ask for Irena, um, which is not her name, <laughs> because the employer is content to have her using uh, false identification. It's, for those who don't know, it's false identification. She is not stealing anybody's identity. She's actually contributing to whoever Elena, uh, Irena is and uh, she's contributing to make her credit rating look much better than it would otherwise look. We have time for a couple more questions, if there are more questions. I would just like to mention that tomorrow at 2 p.m., um, I'll be in class, so I won't be able to attend, but um, a group of me members from Asamblea de Derechos Civiles will, will be going to Eric Paulson's office in Eden Prairie. I believe it's in Eden Prairie. I hope it's in Eden. Yeah. Um, at 2 p.m. tomorrow um, to hold a vigil, as again, for DACA Clean Dream Act. So if you're able to go, I can get you transportation to go and attend that action tomorrow. Otherwise, if you will be interested in going to Washington, D.C. sometime before March and are willing to um, skip school <laughs> and work, let me know so I can put you on the list. So I'll be, you will be the first people that I call um, when we're recruiting if we do decide to go to Washington, D.C. Um, but. Any further questions or comments anybody would like to share? If not, um, thank you all so much for coming. All of you, actually. <clears throat>